looks like he's coming our way. Hopefully we can scare him away. Good morning world. I, guess, I think it's uh, five o'clock in the morning my time here in Western Canada. So the light's a little different because the sliding glass door I put in that wall, I usually, a lot of that light comes in here and it's uh, not quite light enough. Yeah, so anyway, blah, blah, not even awake. Missed a couple days. I had to um, head out to the coast. A, friend, a good friend of mine who depends on guiding a lot uh, his transmission blew up in his boat. Very unfortunate. And he's got to wait to get one from Miami or something. And uh, he had a three-day trip coming up starting this morning. So I went out and got him dialed up with my boat and let him use my boat for the next few days. So that's where I was. And then uh, what did I do? I tried to get a, as many emails shared as I could on the way home. And I stopped at a place where a couple winters ago steelhead fishing has come back i mean it's frozen it's winter time absolutely frozen march and uh i remember there was i actually I explained this in the video but it was where i something was going on everything was so dead quiet it was stupid i felt absolute anxiety and nervous and overwhelmingly creepy and i couldn't take it and i got up off that log pile and i left and then I went there again yesterday and I'll admit it's something's going on in that timber there in that spot, but it's very close to where us native friends of mine have had numerous experiences as well. So obviously something's going on around there and I can feel it. And I did feel, uh, because I put my back to all that great big timber and there's a huge swamp way back there. And I put my back to it when I'm sharing the emails, looking at this camera <laughs> and it didn't feel that great yesterday, but whatever. So I stopped there. And I uh, shared some email, emails, and then I went to another place up the side of a mountain, and I tried to, and I got a, mo a bunch more shared there. So that's what I did. And then I just got home, and last night I tried to crack up my inbox, and there's so many emails, and I'm behind in a lot of emails. So I'll take this second out to get a quick question, quick note to Melba, if you if you're listening, Melba. Um, yes, Doctor Melba Ketchum, I haven't. I think I missed your email. I'll find it today. And Robert, you know who I'm talking to. Um, yeah, I got your your latest email last night, and I'll get hopefully get time to uh, find your previous email, I believe, and, and sort those out and um, get back to Melba as fast as I can. So there, <laughs> that, that helps for me to do, do that here this morning. I don't really wake you guys. Not that smooth. <laughs> yeah, but it's coming. I'll be awake shortly. Now, I will uh, get this video together quickly here and get it out to you guys and get keep the ball rolling. Um, what else? Also, was talking to Edgar again, and I was asking him what the other scientists felt happened to him when he had that freaking bizarre experience. And one of the scientists referred him to a, a very renowned doctor who they do the hypnotherapy. That's where they put you under. Not put you under, but, you know, do the hip, hypnotherapy thing, hypnotize you, whatever it's called. And they take you back to that point of time and you run through it. Every detail again, because Edgar said... There is no way he exposed himself to any radiation at any time at work. He knows that for a fact. And it's blood cancer he's got. Something else. And he is absolutely convinced that he picked up that cancer when all that experience went down. And um, the other scientist figures without a doubt he suffers PTSD as well from that experience he had. So... He's going to do it. He's going to look up this guy and he's going to go for it. And I, by the sounds of it, he just may be able to come on my boat and hang out with him and his wife here uh, this summer for a day. 
and I think I may possibly be able to uh, pull off a live phone call with him. Surely, I've got all the phone numbers. It's just time, right? So maybe I'll be able to. Uh, I'll do a, a phone call and I'll share our conversation with you guys. And hopefully, he doesn't slip up and and say uh, to. I wonder if I should just do that and tape it and then tape it, record it, and then share it with you guys because he may uh, slip up with some details that could possibly jeopardize somebody else work whatever anyway there you go I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna wake up here and um, get this video edited get it delivered to all of you and then hopefully I'll be awake by the time I do that and uh, keep this ball rolling this, this ball of roll knowledge this ball of knowledge is rolling and getting big and it Pretty sure it's unstoppable at this point, right? All because of all you. All because of the people. Sue. So, what else? Um, Sarah. She hasn't been able to do too much with her store where she sells these hats and shirts because um, it's a bit of a hiccup a little while back. And she found a new place and some new items. But it takes two or three weeks to get them. I think she's got a whole, I don't know what she's got left. I think the majority, she's got a lot of these white t-shirts and I keep stealing them. <laughs> out of, I keep stealing them out of the box and then I keep ruining them. <laughs> I keep get. I take, I, I wear them and then uh, all of a sudden I wear one fishing with three drops of fish blood on it. <clears throat> it's toast. <laughs> or whatever. And then I pinch another one. But anyway, if you are into these white ones, which are my favorite ones. Well, I like the blue or gray ones too. Anyway, I like the white ones. She's got a handful of these left, but I keep gobbling up the extra large that are left, and I don't know if she's taking that off the inventory or not, but there's some white ones left. If you want to grab them up, the link will be below. But she's got some real cool stuff, and she made some stuff for the ladies, too. I don't know what, but it's coming. There you go. I'm starting to wake up a little bit. Hope this makes sense, and I'll be a lot smoother shortly. But here's what I recorded yesterday. Remember this place? I guess it's kind of hard. This is where I took everybody two winters ago after uh, steelhead fishing. <clears throat> I sat on these logs right here, my back to this old blocked off road. And these bushes weren't growing up here either. I sat right here and uh, all of a sudden it was like I don't know, it's like I was putting a fishbowl with a lid on. It's so quiet and it was creepy and eerie and something just felt so off here. I couldn't handle it. I couldn't take it. I had to leave. I'm like, okay, I'm out of here. I left. And uh, another weird thing is, is I just uh, measured it from the road signs just over one mile back on the up the road and it was frozen out, absolutely freezing out, frozen ground. My window was down a bit, and all of a sudden I could hear frogs so loud, it sounded like they were right inside the cab of the truck about a mile from here, down the road, before I got here that day. I'll never forget that. It was so freaking weird. Anyway, I'm going to hang out here for a little bit, and I'm on my way home, see what's up in the inbox. Big timber. So I saw my way home. I had to go to the boat. I got to, I got to go fishing. Got a day in fishing anyway. And uh, a friend of mine's boat broke down. He's got a three-day trip coming up. So I got to all geared up to use my boat. Anyway, it's quite the share. The last video, right? If you hadn't seen the last video posted before this one, make sure you go check it out. Let's hear some voices while I'm here and hopefully everything goes smooth while I'm sitting here. This is titled, This Happened to Me. Second time I sent this after I proofread the first one, I went back in and made it easier for you to read. Thank you, Steve. All right, thank you. There's no guarantees I won't butcher it. <laughs> Hi, Steve. I recently discovered your channel on YouTube as we just got Netflix on our smart TV. Otherwise, I'm not socially connected at all. So this is a whole new thing for me. 
I'm hooked on your channel and I appreciate your straightforward, honest approach in dealing with the issues and people. A little background on me. I'm 57 and I have had a lifelong passion for deer hunting, trapping and fishing. I've spent, I've spent hundreds of hours camping, scouting, hunting the western states, pursuing my passion. I spent 11 years in the USMC recon, most of which as a scout sniper. I was involved in many missions all over the Middle East and Africa and Serbia and saw a lot of combat and horrible things. I can handle myself in the woods or anywhere else. My son, he is also a very passionate outdoorsman, hunter, found you on YouTube and convinced me that I needed to write you and tell you my story. He's one of only a few people I've ever told, but he knows my word is the only thing that matters to me. He convinced me that I needed to write to you and tell you my story. He's one of only a few people I've ever told, but he knows my word is the only thing that matters to me. So if I said it happened, I watched some of the TV shows and heard some of the broadcasters and personalities that all seem to think that this is some sort of a joke. I wonder how much time they spent in the woods or how much time they spent with mortars going off all around them and a .762 and .762 AK-47 rounds flying by their face. I wonder why their word would be more honest than mine, douchebags. All the vent you'll get out of me. It was 2006, I was hunting in central Oregon on the east side of the Cascade Range trying to kill a big blacktail, and this is supposed to be prime country. I had my base camp set up about 4,000 feet, I think, in a small clearing about four miles from any road. I spent the first two days scouting and found a buck that I wanted to try for. So on the third morning, I set off an hour before sunrise and started heading up, a, up the slope, a couple of clicks to a good spot where I could easily glass a couple of meadows at first light. I got set up, leaned my rifle against the tree, started wiping the dew off my binoculars. I opened up a power bar and settled in. It was still a little too dark to see, so I started tuning my eyes into the meadow while I ate my breakfast. I'd made at least 20 DYI hunts in western states in my life, but never this particular area as, I've, as I had never killed a big blacktail, and this is supposed to be a good area. DYI means do it do yourself hunts, right? Do it yourself? Anyway, sorry. Not having the funding for an outfitter slash guide, I always went by myself on public land and had a good time. So, first light comes, I start glassing the meadow. I heard some noise off to my left, to the west. It sounded like something was coming up the ridge and it was going to come out in a small neck down that down. It was going to come out in a small neck down that fed into the meadow. So I turned and got my rifle up, assuming it was a deer. I can see movement in the brush about 100 yards to my west, but the brush was thick enough I couldn't make it out, but soon could tell it was not a deer. Eventually I made out that it was upright, so I assumed it was another hunter. He got to the edge of the meadow and stood there, kind of crouched behind some bushes. So I'm getting a little pissed off as someone else has got in the exact area I was in, and I hadn't seen a soul in the two days I'd scouted or even human tracks. So I rose up, slowly, and whistled at the guy, waving my right arm over my head to let him know, hey, there's a hunter here, go somewhere else. He immediately wheeled to his right to face me directly. Then he did that I could see, when he did that, I could see he was immense across the shoulders. I thought, holy Christ, I'm 6'2", 220. He made me look like a child. As soon as he saw me, even though it was dimly lit, I could tell we were looking at each other. He ducked down to the bushes. I thought, what the hell? So I set my rifle back against the tree and stepped out into the meadow so he can get a clear look at me. I started walking towards him. I wanted to hunt this area. I wanted him to go somewhere else. There's plenty of time for him to leave and do that. I took about five steps and he stood up again. This time I could tell it was not a man. It was just too damn big and covered in hair. He started grunting at me and shaking the bushes in front of him. My rifle was still leaning against the tree where I had originally sat, but I raised my Zeiss up and looked at his face. That's binoculars, Zeiss. So you, in case you don't know. I can't tell you a ton of details that I was totally startled, but he had dark hair, certainly all over what I could see except 
for the face, there was a lot of flesh on the face, broad forehead, broad nose, big lips, and a huge set of shoulders and chest. I could never see his legs very well because of the brush. I've spent countless hours looking through binoculars and a rifle scope, and I know exactly what I'm looking at when I'm looking at it. And this was no man. And it was no ape. And it was no joke. And it was no dumbass in a ghillie suit. The whole instant only took a matter of minutes, but it never stopped grunting and growling at me and shaking the bushes. Though it never came out in the clearing or towards me any further, it certainly made me feel like it did not want me there and I was in danger. He was downhill from me, so it was hard for me to judge his height, but the bushes were clearly four to five feet tall, and it was well above those. I'm going to guess it a good seven or eight feet tall with shoulders a good four feet across with massive arms and head were also massive in proportion to a human. I was within 95 yards of this thing with a clean line of sight looking through quality optics. I've never seen anything like it before or since and I do not ever want to see another one. I was very scared. It was a truly, it was a truly a spooky deal. I instinctively backed up and picked up my rifle, shouldered it and centered the crosshairs on his face. It stared at me intently and very menacing. It would have been an easy shot, but something told me inside not to shoot something. Told me it was apps. Sorry, little typo. It would have been an easy shot, but something told me inside not to shoot. Something told me it was absolutely the wrong thing to do. So I held up my rifle with my right hand and raised my left hand over my head and looked at him in submission. Submission. I didn't know what else to do. I turned, slung my rifle, picked up my backpack, and headed back down the trail to camp, never looking back. I've never heard him or saw him again. I got back to my tent, packed up everything, headed down to the truck, went to town. Stayed the night in town, then I drove to a new hunting area 35 miles to the north to finish up my trip the next morning. I didn't want to waste my tag and waste my valuable vacation time, so I tried my best but ended up unsuccessful in filling my tag that season, and yes, I was rattled the whole epic time. I've only told my family and a few close friends my story. My son believes me. I don't know if anyone else does or doesn't. I don't really give a shit. I got nothing to prove to anybody. I know what I saw. And like I said, a man's word should be enough. Thanks for hearing me out. I really appreciate what you're doing. It's nice to have a sounding board to get this off my chest. It's been almost 14 years and I relive it every single day I cannot get it out of my mind. Everything that goes bump in the night or makes a sound in the woods gets my immediate attention. Isn't that crazy? Especially what I've, after what I've been through in life. This is what gives me nightmares, lol. What an effing world we live in, huh Steve? Be careful my friend, God bless, feel free to contact me anytime. You can share my stories with others if you want, Semper Fi, Kurt Johnson. Kurt. I may have read this, or I read something real similar. If I did read it before, there's a shit pile of new people that appreciate it being shared with them anyway. Well, there you go. I'm glad your son found the channel. I'll give a big shout out to him too while we're right here. Yeah, it's a crazy world, man, isn't it? Crazy lifetime. It almost feels like, for me, it feels like I'm starting off from scratch again. It's almost like going to, this, going to school for the first time, starting all over again. Getting rid of the previous programming and learning real truth now, right? Finally learning real truth and it's crazy ass. The truth is frickin' crazy ass. Listen to this. This is titled, Big Ugly, <laughs> Big Ugly, Big Ugly Effer. Good afternoon to you, Mr. Steve. I've been sitting on the story for quite some time. I'm not into cryptids and honestly never have been. Me neither. However, I'd like to tell you my story about what happened to my brother and myself around 16 years ago. Our family owns a little, four, a little over 400 acres in Middle Tennessee. We mostly farm cattle and sheep here on our farm. We have around 300 acres of wooded land that butts up to roughly 1,800 acres of, of TWRA land. On top of one of the hills sits our deer cabin, 
where our interaction happened. Me and my brother hiked up one evening with our dog, Colt, to stay in the cabin so we could get started hunting early in the morning. About three quarters of the hike up, we came to an X made out of tree limbs in the middle of the trail. We found this strange due to the trees around where this X was did not have any branches missing. My brother made a comment that he thought our dad may have done that to detour a hunter who may have wandered onto our property from the public land. Didn't make any sense to me, but I went along with it. When we got to the cabin, we noticed that there was a strange smell like rotten eggs. The smell just seemed to linger there all evening. I'm getting attacked by a deer fly. Come on, get out. This smell just seemed to linger there all evening. We put our stuff up and began collecting some wood so we could start a fire in the fireplace instead. This cabin has no electricity. Our dog Colt started acting really strange, almost like he was scared. However, he stayed by our sides and never made a noise. We finally got settled into the cabin for the night and was ready to hit the sack. Colt was really anxious, so my brother put him outside thinking he needed to relieve himself. I just covered up when I heard Colt yelping. I just covered my head. I jumped out of the bed. I was, I think he probably meant I was just covered up when I heard Colt yelping. I jumped out of the bed and grabbed a light to see what the fuss was about. I shined the light off to where he was yelping from, and out of nowhere, he came flying back towards me, like he had been thrown. I ran inside and slammed the door shut. My brother looked at me and said, why the hell did you do that? I didn't realize I left the dog outside. I told him, someone threw Colt at me. He pushed me aside, and opened the door, and Colt walked back inside like nothing happened. The only lighting we have in the cabin is from the fireplace and a couple of lanterns we, ha lanterns we have hanging up. I grabbed my flashlight so I can examine him better to see if he's okay, and he had four spots on his back about two inches from each other that the hair had been ripped off. It looked like something had grabbed him. I showed my brother who didn't believe me what I just witnessed. Two freaking minutes ago, the spots and he didn't have an explanation. This isn't a little purse dog. This is a 55, 60 pound lap. I felt uneasy, but really couldn't do anything about it. So we decided it's best to hit the sack so we can wake up early to go hunting. Mind you, the rotten egg smell never went away. It must have been around 2.45, 3 a.m. when I woke to go take a leak. I opened up the cabin door to walk outside to relieve myself. I remember having a strange feeling over me while standing there half awake with my diddly stick in my hand. As it wrapped up, I remember hearing this strange, deep growl. The best I could describe it was a lion gnarling, gnarling over fresh meat. As I turned to go back inside, I was met at the door by my brother, walking out to do the same thing I just did. I walked inside and was headed to the bed again when I heard him hollering for me to bring the light. I ran outside and shined the light around until he jerked it out of my hand and shined it himself. I'll never forget this moment. The light hit this ugly bastard's face. This thing was massive. Big ping pong size eyes that narrowed towards its nose. It let out a growl that I felt to the bone. I don't know how, but it was gone in a flash. Now thinking back, I'm assuming my brother moved, moved the light off of it while moving back towards the door. And that's why it disappeared so fast. We didn't sleep at all for the rest of the night. That first light in the morning, we hightailed it out of there. We told our dad about what had happened that night the following morning. He told us that he had seen another X out of limbs on one of his trails that he would use to check the back fence lines. He made us go back out to the cabin with him to show him where we believed it, it to be standing the night before. The rotten egg smell was no longer present. We weren't able to find any signs of this thing, no tracks because on top of the hill, it was mostly rock. He wanted, to leave, he wanted to believe us, but wasn't sure about the story we told him. He told us that the occasional black bear will move through the area, and that's what we must have seen. My brother asked him, well, what about the marks on Colt? And he honestly had no explanation. It must have been a week later when my dad and I were on his John Deere gator checking fence lines early one morning. He stopped the gator while looking off into the hillside. There it was again, this ugly, 
this F ugly thing standing there looking at us. I have no idea how tall this thing was due to it being on a hillside covered in brush. It tore off up the hill and was gone in no time. It was so fast, my dad was speechless. He didn't know what to tell me. He told the neighbor what, what we have seen and the neighbor replied with him seeing the same man in his chicken coop one night and maybe that's the man we'd seen. No person would come out into these woods and mess with people. This is a very 2A friendly area. I don't know what that means. We've never seen this thing again. Never had any issues with livestock missing. Every once in a while I'll get a sniff of rotten eggs and get uneasy. I don't let it stop me from enjoying the woods I grew up in. I don't know if it ever had any intention in hurting us or not. I have full, I have full intent of shooting it dead if I see it again. I've only told this story to a handful of people. These Bigfoot people honestly crack me up. I've only told this story to a handful of people. These Bigfoot people honestly crack me up. Walk through the woods whooping and whistling like this thing's a turkey and it's just gonna holler back at them. I do wish to remain anonymous because this is a small town and I don't want to bring any attention to myself or family. I just want people to know that these things do exist. I don't think they have these telepathic powers and shapeshift bullshit like the BFRO virgins say. <laughs> I want anyone who has ever dealt with this to still get out in the woods. Don't let us stop from doing what you love. Nap those things. Enough of my rambling. I appreciate everything you do with your channel. Keep up the good work, my friend. Thanks for hearing me out. All right, thanks for sharing. Appreciate the share. And you're going to do what you're going to do, but from what I have learned and what I've felt, uh, I would strongly suggest you don't try to kill one unless, you're prov unless it's provoking you for real. I believe that would bring you a lot of... that just bring you a, uh, a shitstorm you would want to deal with. That's what I think. I met a guy whose uncle, I believe it was, native guy, shot one on the island here. Said he, he dropped it. Got scared. I don't know if he dumped it or... Maybe he did drop it. But anyways, he shot his deer on it. Shot him not too far from where I live. And he lived way up over the other side of the mountains, near the other side of the island. And when he got home, his single wide trailer got absolutely annihilated from the outside. And he couldn't take it, ended up taking his own life. And uh, the young guy I talked to said that his trailer was absolutely beat to death on the outside. And that was miles away from where he pulled the trigger on that being he saw in the timber when he was hunting deer. Anyway, you might want to think twice about that one, man. And uh, keep listening to all the people here, right? Keep listening to the people and listen to the knowledge and hear what people got to say and share about what they saw. Because now that you've seen what you've seen, it should be a lot easier to listen to the people speak about what they've seen too, right? Anyway. Let's see if I got another one. This is titled Bigfoot Free Climb. Hi, Steve. You use my name, Daniel Meadows. I'm not a member of the Club of No Return. I wish I was. Maybe someday. I live in Shasta County, California. and spent a lot of time camping as a teen with my friend and his family back in the 70s and 80s. My friend's dad and his uncle built a rustic A-frame cabin we used as a camp on the Trinity River in the Trinity National Forest. The funnest part of getting to the cabin was crossing the river to get it, to get to it. The entry point was pretty shallow, and the exit point to the water was about 48 inches, 150 feet downstream. We always took the old 60s four-wheel drive. It was about 13 miles off the main road back to the cabin. It was a lot of fun riding on the homemade lumber rack, watching the dogs swimming in the truck bed as we crossed, just barely dancing off the tops of the rocks in the river bottom. We would usually go up there deer hunting in the fall. I don't remember hearing any sounds or seeing anything during my times there over the years. My last time there, it was my, it was only my friend and I, no dogs, no adults. We had gone up at the end of summer. We just got our driver's license and he talked his dad into letting us borrow the hunting rig for our first trip on our own. The area had been heavily hydraulic mined in the 1800s and as a result there were a lot of ditches that started deep pin 
that started deep in the forest. Oh, all right, started deep in the forest and followed the contour of the terrain down to where miners were working uphill and inland from the river. We'd always hunted with the adults before. This time, we were going to explore things on our own time and terms. It was not deer season, so squirrels beware. We soon realized what a great game trail these ditches were. And we got on the first ditch, we got on the first ditch we found and walked for what seemed like miles, spotting little piles of scat along the way. The ditches were approximately four feet wide and about two and a half feet deep, with the downhill side about one and a half feet wide at the top, but empty water. We thought there would be a source, a spring or something up ahead. We followed the ditch for a few hours and came up upon why there is no water in the lower section. The ditch wall had blown out on the downhill side we had been walking on, about 10 feet of blowout. This had diverted the water from above the ditch, from above in the ditch down into the ravine below us. The diversion had been going on for probably decades. The ravine was covered in ferns and had created a good sized pond probably 100 feet across. We stood at the edge taking it all in like we just found Atlantis. So dark and mossy and damp back in there, it was its own ecosystem, that's for sure. I remember leaves floating on the surface and the water was like glass. It's about four o'clock in the afternoon and we're on the eastern slope of the face of this bridge, so we're not getting any help from the sun. We both remarked you could hear a pin drop, not an animal moving anywhere, and then we saw something that I had not thought about in a very long time. On the west side of the pond, or bowl of water, there's a sheer granite face about 30 feet high and was well covered with moss. You could distinctly see where there were multiple moss perches on this face which had been repeatedly been used with wet feet. It's a loud helicopter. You could distinctly see whether where there were multiple moss perches on this face which had been repeatedly being used with wet feet. The moss perch was also mildly gray instead of bright green of the untouched moss in the face. We decided to head back down to camp hoping to not run into something coming up the game trail or down the trail. It's not something we thought about when starting out on this expedition. That'll happen 40 years ago. I'm now an engineer and I have been for 30 years. I love to hear the different possible technologies intertwined with these strange events. It's exciting to think of what will be revealed to us over the years to come. I recently was talking to my friend from that trip and asked him how he remembered that day. His recall was the same as mine, but he thought the Warren purchase could have been from a large cat or deer. I told him as an engineer, I see a pattern of three perches going up the face of handholds or footholds, going vertical in pattern left to right with a horizontal distance of about eight feet and the pattern vertical starting about two feet above the waterline with spacing of about eight feet in between each hole. I chalk up dislodging this memory as a direct result of coming across your channel and listening to people who write in to you about their own experiences. I love the energy you put forward, sorry, I love the energy you put toward getting people heard. Thanks again, keep up the fight. Did you say to use your name? Yep, Daniel Meadows. Yeah, I already read that. Appreciate you, Dan. Good observations too, huh? Now what was climbing up that rock face? Anyway, I think I'm gonna carry on. Kind of windy here. I might stop somewhere else along the way. See if I can fly somewhere out of the wind. I hate the wind of the camera, it sucks. But at least it's not deadly quiet here. Back a little bit. There's some big bull elk living around right here. I videotaped that one in the timber on the other side of the valley last fall, and I also bumped into a huge one right here on this old road. Had like a dozen cows with them. Got shitty video that wasn't in focus. Then uh, 
So the main logging road is down there in the bottom of the valley, so you might hear the odd vehicle go by. So I can see where the elk have been using this road. It's, it's crushed rock, but you can still see those, those hoof prints. I don't know if you can tell, but that tree behind me, there's a young one back here behind me. It's all stripped of old leaves all the way up from a black bear. Lots of life around here. Can't see it, but it's here. Now, it's hot out. Not so much wind here. A bit of a view. Listen to this. Steve, Steve, my name is Jeff McComas. I'm an honorably discharged Navy veteran and ground thought father of 15. I'm 53 years old now, and in those 53 years, I've seen and learned a lot. In 1986, while deer hunting into what is now the Wayne National Forest in southern Ohio, I saw what I'm pretty sure was a female Sasquatch, and she was carrying a little one. It was the second day of whitetail season, and that year I decided to go to what I called a honey hole, where I knew that a couple of big bucks had been making a ruckus. I got to my stand really early that morning, and it was still dark. So I leaned back on the tree, and was resting my eyes, and all of a sudden, I heard a really solid buzzing sound. I thought it was a large hornet's nest that hadn't gotten cold enough for the hornets to leave. Well, as daylight started to break, I caught movement out of the corner of my eye. And as I focused on it, I could make out a hair-covered, bipedal being bending down at one of the old strip mine ponds that were there. Okay, there's no punctuation, okay, guys? I watched it, her, giving the small one water. Either that or she was cleaning it. She never looked in my direction. And as fast as she appeared, she disappeared. Now, every day I think of that encounter, and I try to tell myself that it was something else. But it was what it was. A Sasquatch and nobody can make me believe any different. Okay, there's my story. And here's something extra. Yesterday, yesterday my daughter sent me some trail cam pics that my son-in-law had gotten and he was hunting in the same general area that my encounter took place way back in 86. Well, as I'm looking through these pictures, I noticed a face. Now, it might be pareidolia or maybe an actual creature, I don't know. And I know that you don't analyze photos, but please shoot me an email back and tell me what you think. Feel free to use my name on this photo. Thanks for listening and making this topic easy to discuss. Keep up the good work, and God bless Jeff. Okay, Jeff, I don't think I can see this myself. I can't. It's too bright for me in my face. So I'll have to post it up once I get home, and you guys have a look at this. Looks like there's something there. If you get a, if you get a, a chance, Jeff, and you feel like it one day, email us back again and give us a little more of a detailed description of that thing you saw, right? That being that person. How long was its hair? How big was it? How did it appear? How did it disappear? Vanish? As in poof? Or did it move to disappear from you? I appreciate you and your time, man. Listen to this one. Holy cow, it's getting hot. Hello, Steve. You're the man. Keep up the good work. Keep up the good fight, my man. All right, thanks. No problem. I will. The story happened about six years ago. I was an archery brown bear hunt outside of Talkeetna, Alaska. Hunting bears during the salmon run, there was plenty of downtime during the day. So my guide and myself were having some hot chocolate, and the outfitter and his hunters stopped to check in with their airboat since we were camped right on the river. The other hunter was a doctor from Wisconsin. I'm going to leave the outfitter's name out of it intentionally since he never said directly to me to share this story. All right, I know a few outfitters up there, and I know a guide from Talkeetna that I hunted with in Kodiak. Okay, so we're all having a cup of hot chocolate, chatting about some of our previous hunts. I was telling the doctor about an elk hunt I was on in Montana. We were in deep draw with myself and my guide, and we happened to see what it looked like a huge print in the dirt on a path we're walking down. I, off the cuff, said to my guide man, that looks like a Bigfoot print. Without hesitation, he said to me 
that his brother refuses to come in this canyon slash draw again. He explained to me that a few years prior to this, his brother came into this particular canyon to pack out an elk, a hunter's elk, had shot earlier that day. It was dusk and he was in there alone with two pack horses. He had butchered the elk up and was heading back up the trail to his vehicle when, about 30 yards in front of him, he saw an eight foot tall, what he said was clearly a Bigfoot. It screamed at him a couple of times. The horses got all nervous and it was all he could do to keep them from busting out of there. After about 30 seconds, the Bigfoot ran down the hill off the trail crashing on two legs. He got out of there as fast as he could and refused to ever go back in there again. Fast forward back to my brown bear hunt and the four of us sitting having hot chocolate as I told them this story. With a straight face, the outfitter looked at us and said, I've seen three. Then he said nothing else. The doctor and I looked at each other and said, well, you got to tell us a story. He then told us that during the winter, he goes up in north, northern Alaska, deer flies again, to hunt and trap wolves, which he sells the hides for money. He said that him and another guy were on snowmobiles headed to an area they were going to set up a camp. It was below zero temperatures and snowing and getting toward evening. He mentioned that my guide had been with him in this particular area hunting wolves before. At any rate, he needed to get to a particular area, so to try to save time, he is going to go between two mountains instead of going all the way around. He said it was pretty open when the when the first started heading typos. I think he meant when he first started heading through this pass and as they got further in, it became narrower and steeper on each side. As he's moving along fairly fast, he noticed lots of depressions in the snow like footprints. But as I said, they were going really fast. Then he said the pass opens up and he noticed lots of bones as he described it, scattered all around in this opening, at the back of this opening there was a cave and he could see two figures standing in this cave. One big one, hold on, no punctuation for a bit here you guys, and I'm getting attacked. Alright, that's enough. Get out. Two figures standing in this cave, one big one, one smaller. He said they came to a stop and he couldn't comprehend what he was seeing. And all of a sudden they started screaming. He did up he he did up to his right as the hillside was steep. Typos. He got up to his right, something to his right as the hillside was steep. There was a huge creature coming at them fast with what he said looked like a big piece of mammoth tusk screaming loud and running downhill at them. He said the pass was narrow behind. Sorry. He said the pass was narrow behind, so it was hard to turn their snow sh machines around. He said his buddy started to turn his around. The other creature was closing on them fast. It was surreal. And these things were screaming the all while. Let me also say, when hunting in Alaska, everyone always carries a big gun, big handgun in a holster on their chest. Something I, something even I had done when I was on my archery hunt. It was mandatory, at least with this outfitter. Anyhow, back to the story. This creature was closing fast and he pulled his handgun and fired three shots at this creature, which he said was for sure going to kill him. And the last shot was less than 10 feet away, right into the forehead of this creature. He said he killed it. And then the... This is some typos, I'm sorry you guys. He said he killed it and then the went crazy from the other ones. The steaming typos. Sorry. He said he killed it, then the blank went crazy from the other ones. He said in below zero temperatures, his buddy in a struggle to get out of there pissed his pants. He said they both got out of there as fast as they could, heading back the way they came. Me and the doctor looked at each other, mouths open in disbelief. 
He explained that this thing looked human in many ways, like Neanderthal-like, not an ape. I said, why didn't you take the body? It would have been infamous. His response was, he had no idea if there were more in that cave, and this thing was for sure coming to kill him. He had no doubt. He and the other hunter left to head back down the river to their camp, and after they left, I said to my guide, was he bullshitting me? My guide said he had known him for over 20 years in two things. One, he wasn't a bullshitter, and two, he had never heard that story before. However, he did know the area he was talking about. He said that you may never see another human if you live there your entire life. Fast forward to my last day before heading home, I said to the outfitter, that Bigfoot story, was that a true story or were you bullshitting me? And he looked at me and said, if I said it was true, that would make me a murderer. I'm like, what the F kind of answer is that? He said he's certain that these things are our ancestors or human-like. This thing was no ape or gorilla. That's how we left it. Let me also say this guy's sole life is spent in the woods in outfitting and hunting and trapping. He was born a century too late. That kind of guy. Anyhow, that's the story. Thanks, Duff. And that's not the first time we've heard of somebody smoking one and killing it either, right? Oh man, some deer flies, horse flies, black flies, whatever's ripping around or after my ass, but... That's one hell of a story. That's one hell of an experience. It sounds like it was uh, more than likely legit, right? You forgot to tell us how you made out on the hunt. <laughs> or did you? Alaska, there's been a lot of violent encounters in Alaska. A lot of people gone missing in Alaska, and as well the Northwest Territories. Why is that? Is it a different... Uh, who knows how many? I haven't a frickin' clue, man. I don't know how many different variations of beings there are ripping around that we don't know about. We've got a lot to learn yet, right? Hopefully some people are going to share with us a, a lot of stuff to clear it up, clear up the mysteries, but... You can't dismiss the word of your fellow man anymore. You can't, you can't not listen to your, your fellow members of the community, right? And you know. You know, you know in your gut what's authentic or not when it comes to people sharing. You know. I think we know a lot more than we allow ourselves to think we know. If that makes any sense? I believe we know the answers to a lot. It's just our brains won't. I don't know what's going on. Do our brains just not allow it? be accepted by us or you were looked at even more than a couple seconds I don't know I haven't a clue I think this is a moment where my lips aren't mesh meshing up with my brain but anyway this is hot out it was foggy where I was on the oceans it was actually kind of chilly now I'm getting back inland and we have a heat wave and it is smoking out let's see if I get one more or I'm gonna go back to the shop and do one inside get more and share it inside maybe Wow. Wow, right? Ooh, this is a long one. I'll see if I can pull it off without getting chomped. If I get if I keep getting chomped, I'm gonna leave. Hey Steve, been watching your channel for over a year now and I've decided to finally send in my story because I honestly can't think of a better person to share it with. Alright, thanks for that kind gesture. My first experience was about four years after I moved across my small town of Ultawa. Tennessee, here in the States. So back in 2003, I was delivering newspapers in my local area. I had to wake up early and be at the newspaper place to pack and load my papers in my car at 3 a.m. Me and a buddy of mine were out on my delivery route, delivering papers, and we always stopped at the same spot to take papers from the trunk and place them into the back seat for easy access to finish the route at about the halfway mark. The halfway mark we stopped the halfway mark we stopped at was down a dead-end road that ended at a fence to a field and the field went on for about 100 150 yards then head into hit hit into the forest so one night my buddy is with me and we were stopped in that spot at 4 a.m. maybe 4 30 and we heard what sounded like a woman being murdered out in the woods it sent chills down my spine 
and we looked at each other for a split second, and both jumped in the car and I took off. Now at the time I didn't think much about it, thinking maybe it was a mountain lion or just a homeless per person screwing with us. So fast forward 12 years, after not really hearing anything else, The scream was less than a mile from my house, or around the one mile mark. At this time in 2015, I was married, and me and my wife would go out and smoke. We used to hear weird noises in the woods, and hear what sounded like footsteps almost every night to the point I was convinced some homeless person was staying in the woods across the road or close by. We separated after a couple of years, and in April 2018, I was here by myself, and the power went out one night because of some storms rolling through the area fell asleep waiting for the power to come back on and woke up right exactly at 3 a.m. and I will never forget what happened next. I grabbed my flashlight, went outside, smoked a cigarette, and stepped, oh you little bugger, got me. Sorry, now I lost my spot, ruthless little bloodsuckers. Damn. I grabbed my flashlight, went outside to smoke a cigarette, and I stopped outside side with my light on and shined it across the road in the pitch black of the night, when my light caught huge green eyes, about 10 feet off the ground in a little clearing. Now, to the left of the woods, across from my house, the woods cut out into a small clearing where there is three trees scattered, 30 feet from each other. This is not something in a tree. I know that much because my flashlight, oh, little bastard, sorry. My little flashlight is a 1400 lumen LED light, and I have seen eight point bucks over there in that clearing before at night eating grass, the entire deer, color and all. Now this thing was jet black to the point where I couldn't even make out an outline of what I suspect to be one of these beings. The whole time I was outside smoking, from the time I spotlighted this thing and saw its eyes, that looked as big as golf balls from 40 yards away, it never even blinked or looked away. For the whole five to seven minutes, I stared at it. It seemed as though I surprised it as, it as it was trying to come close to the other houses down the road in the pitch black darkness with the power being out and probably was curious as to why the lights were out because that night, the power, the power was out for nine hours from 11 p.m. until 8 a.m. The power finally came back on my last encounter was seven months later on Thanksgiving Day, when my brother was in town from Pennsylvania. We had eaten dinner and sitting around talking, and once again I decided to step outside on my front steps and smoke. I've been out there a few times, and at 8 p.m. it was already dark out. And all of a sudden, I hear some kind of ruckus in the woods. I grabbed my 1400 lumen flashlight again that was sitting inside next to the door, and shined it across the road into the woods. And I saw, it, I saw not one, but two sets of those same green eyes. One was crouched down, sort of like a human would crouch, and it looked up at me, just like a person would. It was so creepy. The second one walked away to my right, as if to try to take my attention off the one that was crouched and kept looking forward, then back at me. It really reminded me of how in the Patterson film, how Patty walked and kept turning its head around looking back at the camera. Just exactly like that. And I could barely make out an outline this time, and they both looked to be on two legs. The one walking to the right walked about 20 feet before I noticed a car was coming and the car lights shined right on the crouched down one. So I know for sure, whoever that was in that car also saw at least one of the two that I saw. But when the car showed up, I turned my light off so it wouldn't look like I was trying to shine it at cars to be a, a dingus. <laughs> so those are my sightings. Even though I saw mostly eye shine, I believe what I saw was one of these Sasquatch beings. To me, it's the only logical explanation. I went and looked across the road because at first I thought the two were small or young adults. But then I saw there was a two foot drop off where they were standing. So by my estimate of the two I saw together was shorter. Sorry, you guys. But then I saw the two foot drop off where they were standing, so by my estimation of two I saw together, was shorter than the first one, as seven, eight feet tall. I used to watch the show Unsolved Mysteries when I was a kid in the 90s, and I've always believed in extraterrestrial life 
the Bigfoot thing, I could see how that was possible now. Back when I was a kid, I was on the fence about Bigfoot because I spent so much time in the woods back then that I thought I would, I would have seen one if there was one to be seen. But now I know they can watch slash follow you without ever, without you ever knowing. I believe wholeheartedly. I believe wholeheartedly in what you're doing, trying to get the truth out there to people who need to know. I also believe there are a handful of people on this earth who know more than the population has ever forgotten because we have forgotten too much. We need to get back to the old ways of doing things and help our neighbors like we used to. This may not be the best story to share, but if you want to share this on video, feel free to. And thank you for what you're doing. Sincerely, Paul from Tennessee. Paul, appreciate your kind words and words of encouragement, man. And your email, the time you took to share that with us. You know what you saw. I think that's the answer for everybody, right? You know what you saw, or heard. You come here looking for this email on YouTube, finding all this crew of people here, and go out of your way to share your experience, questioning yourself. You already know. You got to the point, you're sharing it here, you know. Now, I'm roasting, and these frickin' little deer flies are chomping the shit out of me. Oh, do you guys remember that video uh, I vintage last fall, recorded, and I went to the edge of the timber, on a steep bank, and you could see those elk running around through the trees down below, and I zoomed in on that great big six point, and you stand there listening. Remember that? Well, that was right in the bottom. Right on the other side of this valley, the bottom of those, that slope, right in the very bottom there. I can't wait to see what's running around here this fall. I'm going to put trail cameras all over the place and see if I can get a bunch of these monster elk on video here. Some pretty gnarly hills back there, right? Pretty gnarly. But anyway, I haven't checked my inbox for a handful of days, so once I get back I'll check the inbox, see what Edgar's got to say and everyone else, and then uh, keep this ball rolling, keep the information flowing. Keep encouraging everybody to, to share it. Not be not be scared anymore. Just share the, share what you got. It's a safe place to do it. And I shall return. I am so it's so hot here right now, and it's going to be way hotter at home. Ugh. All right, here we go. I'll be back. Share my story at howtohunt.com. All right. That's how you share it with the people here. So he's been there the whole time. He's eating something off the rocks, eh? 